we are talking about prana and chakras this time. The last time we spoke about some practices such as Shitalikarna, Yoga Nidra, Shravyatra, and we were already speaking of Adi Prana. So naturally, when we are at the state of Adi Prana, we come into the area of chakras. What are chakras? Chakras are nothing other than energy hubs. I like this example of the internet. What is the internet made up of? It's made up of information, wires, okay, um, fiberglass cable wires, which are various parts of the world. And this information is in form of um, bits, bytes, and it's accessible from anywhere, provided you have internet connection, either mobile phone or a laptop. However, there are certain places in the world where these wires and these fiberglass cables seem to collect. They are like hubs and they are cross-sections. Um, somebody is online and I think that must be Samya who is probably the only phone yeah. caller. Yeah. Could you mute Samya because we can hear you? Okay, I'm muting myself. Yeah. So these hubs are places where there are huge collection or interconnection of these um, wires or um, however we should call them, cable, fiberglass cable. And one such place, one of the world's biggest hub, internet hub, is very close to where we are in Frankfurt. It's one of the world's largest hubs. What happens if the internet in the entire world is functioning but one of these hubs doesn't work? doesn't mean that the entire internet connection in the entire world collapses. It still functions. But naturally, it may not function very well. Maybe there are some blockages, there are problems in certain areas. Certain websites may not be available, right? Maybe too slow, whatever. There is a certain, there are certain limitations if one of the hub goes down. This hub is where energy is concentrated. If you think of the human body, as energy, which is floating through the energy in all the nerves throughout the body, they are like these fiberglass cables. And those places where there is a greater interconnection of these nerves, those centers are known as chakras, wheels because they are like wheels of life. Life seems to be very densely focused in these areas, just like the internet hubs. There's a lot of energy flowing around there. Similarly, in the human body, there are seven main hubs. And these hubs, chakras, wheels of life, are where the energy, the prana, is especially concentrated. 
when we want to access energy, just think in terms of physics. If you go into the desert, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of energy. If you want to cook an omelet, you take a pan, you break an egg, and you put it out in the desert on a, you know, just out there. Do you think that omelet will cook? Anybody wants to make an educated guess? Or does somebody know the answer to that? Uh, hi. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, the problem would be the focus. It's just a lot of heat which is spread in a lot of places. Yes. So this experiment has been done before and the energy is not focused. It's all over the place. And so as Gautam said, the intensity is required. And that intensity is in these hubs or to use the internet terminology, but yogic terminology is chakras, these wheels of life. The energy is especially concentrated, or the prana is especially concentrated in these areas. Some of the practices that we have discussed, like 61 points, is kind of mapping these channels in the body. <clears throat> if you cut open the body, will you find these nadis? Will you find chakras? No. We know that. It was not always known. Until about 150 years ago or so, Cutting the human body, a cadaver, a corpse, was taboo in almost all parts of the world. It was a taboo, considered a taboo by almost all religions of the world. So also, Indian medicine, like Ayurveda, etc., or the Arabic forms of medicine, the Arabs were very advanced in medicine, but dissecting a corpse was taboo. Same in other parts of the world also. So nobody really knew how the inside of the human body looked. They had some ideas. They had made some guesses, but not very accurate ones. The yogic body had been mapped through intuition and through meditation. So the actual mapping of the gross body had never been done by dissecting the body because it was considered absolute taboo. And why it is, we will come to that shortly. But the subtle body had been mapped through practices like 61 points by those who were able to go deeper to that subtler level of consciousness. Every practice has four levels. You could be doing some practices, but, but staying very much at the superficial level, first level, which is known as Vaikhari. If you go a little deeper, that would be Madhyam. If you go to the third level, which is very subtle and very fine level in the practice, it's known as Pasyanti. So those who are able to go to that third level, they can map the energies of the body. And that's what they did through intuition, through meditation. And they said there are something like 72,000 channels. There are different points in the body which are known as marmas, and that has been studied far more deeply in Ayurveda, Ayurveda and yoga being sister sciences. So this is where they meet. They, the study of the mind and the body, it meets here. 
So when the study was done, they discovered chakras. And so when India was conquered, invaded and conquered by the British, British doctors who had overcome the Christian taboo of dissecting the body came to India and they were very amused by this study of energy channels because they had cut open the human body and found nothing like this. They didn't find little round chakras with lotus leaves on it or anything similar to that. But they were looking for the wrong things. They were trying to look for that exactly that which, which was given in the diagram. The diagram itself is written or uh, is a, uh, a coded way of handing down this knowledge. Today we know that the nervous system is what the yogis were talking about. The spine is what we are talking about in yoga, that the energy of the body is concentrated here in the spine and the brain. Along this spine, there are places where a tremendous amount of nerves intersect. And these places are in modern science known as plexus. So you have a solar plexus which corresponds to the Manipura chakra. You have the heart, you have the throat where there are a lot of glands. Similarly at the Agya chakra there are a lot of glands intersecting. So these are all places where there is a lot of energy concentrated along the spine. The Manipura Chakra, the solar plexus, is the largest among all and the one of the most important. Most people focus in meditation of course on Agya Chakra, the third eye or the heart center which is Anahat Chakra but in terms of energy, health and the body, it is the Manipura Chakra, which is the most important. So this is how the body was mapped. It's actually an energy field and the chakras are part, the nadis and the chakras are part of that map. And if you practice the practices that we talked about the last time, having done them systematically without interruption over a long period of time, with guidance, doing them systematically as we have discussed them, then the chances are that you will be able to map your own body energy. When you are able to do that, you can even heal yourself. You will find where the blockages are in the body, which nadis are blocked, which chakras are blocked, and then you can remove those blockages. Okay, good so far. Anybody has any questions? Just continue. One of the reasons why cutting a human body, or dissecting a human body, even a corpse, was considered to be taboo was that this is an energy field that is very deeply, intricately 
interconnected. It's exactly the example that I gave you of the internet. If we put down that hub which is here in Frankfurt, which is one of the largest hubs in the world, we don't know what is going to be the result of this. How is this going to affect the internet throughout the world? Similarly, if one of the centers is blocked, this is going to have effects in various parts of the body, right? Not just around the solar plexus. It's not going to be localized because those nerves that are passing through the solar plexus are carrying information from the brain to various parts of the body. They pass through. So, if the body is so intricately connected, if you cut open the very, very delicate, even the finer nerves, these nadis are more subtler versions of the nerves. They are not nerves. Nerves are the grosser version. And the nadis are the subtler and the energy channels. It's like differentiating between the brain and the mind. The mind is a much subtler aspect. We tend to localize it around the brain, but if you cut open the brain, you don't see any thoughts. Similarly, when you cut open nerves, you don't really see the energy channels there. You don't see the, the nadis. So if you would dissect the body, you would be damaging these subtle energy nerves. And we do not know what impact this would have on the rest of the body on very subtle energy levels. So the same is true for those who go for some kind of operations. Same is true. Because when a surgeon is cutting the body, we do not know really what aspect uh, of you would be affected. Since the biggest energy center chakra is the Manipura chakra, it also manages the health in the body. When that chakra is open, flowing, functioning, the energy from most of the nadis is flowing through this, which means that your body would be much healthier. If it is blocked here, you will have a lot of health issues. So one practice that is done to open and activate this chakra is Agni Sara. Agni means fire and Sara... Uh, can I interrupt you? Yeah, sure. So you, you talked about damaging and the... Uh, Settler energy channels. Yes. But is this also concerned in a dead body, uh, in a cadaver dissecting that? Yes, yes. Ashish, I think we had had this conversation earlier, <laughs> but it's okay. No, for, for him, it's like a body which has been dead like yes. uh, maybe a month or so. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That is why, that is why there has been an ancient tradition, again in all cultures of the world, not to um, you know, uh, uh, donate, <laughs> as we say, you know, this organ donation has become very popular now, but not to do that. Because it's like I said, if we take out this Internet Hub Frankfurt here, we don't know what impact is going to have on the Internet. Similarly, once even once you're dead and we take out one organ, that would affect the entire energy channels, all of them. And this is your blueprint. This, this is your blueprint. The body and the mind. The body is a grosser version of the mind. And so 
even though the body may be clinically speaking dead, the subtle energies are still going to leave the body, they're going to go and then those are the blueprints which will take us to our next body. Now there have been stories and I'm not going to tell you whether I believe in them or not, whether they're true or not, who knows. But those who have experienced in one life a certain, say, uh, um, unnatural death. Let us say, for example, unnatural death in the form of an execution, you know, beheaded. That person may experience in another lifetime certain problems which may be related to that event. So imagine that somebody who might drown, you know, breathing water, lungs are full, may eventually have some problems as well related to the lungs in the next life. It sounds esoteric. I cannot tell you whether this is true or not, but this has been suggested through the study of these sciences and through internal study in your laboratory of the of meditation. So once the body is person is dead. Still that body, you know, through all cultures of the world, it's a big taboo to disturb the body. Or, but once it's dead, it's normally in, it's, uh, our custom is to burn it. But it's burned fully together. You know, it all goes together as a blueprint, which should not be disturbed otherwise. So, it says also, one says that, that this um, people are... You know, the, the consciousness hovers around the body for a long time. It's only when it's fully burnt that it's, that the soul, the jivatman can leave completely. It's not attached anymore to the body. So there's a, a final connection of these channels. And there are certain aspects that... Um, Modern science, of course, um, would not agree with. They would call this hocus-pocus, and maybe it is, who knows. It's only a matter of practicing and confirming it yourself, or, of course, confirming the opposite. So, would that be the reason that many yogis were buried rather than cremated? Is it? Possibly, yes, possibly. There have been many forms of samadhi. Which were given. There was Jal Samadhi and uh, uh, you know different forms. So there's uh, it's not that one was preferred to the other. It depends on what they preferred. It's not like one is superior to the other. Okay. It's you know these are the mysteries of life and death. So to activate the Agni within the body, within the Manipura Chakra, we practice Agni Sara. And Sara is coming from the word like you have Mana Sarovar. It is a big lake in the Himalayas. Sarovar, Sara means a lake. So it's a lake of energy or a lake of fire which is in your body. And through this practice, one can activate this. It's very difficult to explain this practice because um, there is not much to explain it other than that you stand with your feet about, you know, um, half, um, half a foot or about six inches apart. You put your weight, you know, your palms of your hand on your knees or your thighs and you rest the weight of your bodies of your body of your upper trunk on your knees keeping the back still straight not bent but straight then 
you exhale and contract the muscles in the lower abdomen pull them in and up then you exhale and allow the body uh, sorry then you inhale and allow the muscles to relax you just release the muscles so the effort is only in ex during exhalation contracting the muscles in the lower abdomen and that's all to the practice it's not complicated difficult practice but many people make mistakes here one is that they think that um, this is they're not able to locate this particular muscle in the lower abdomen which you pull in and up and then out and down so it's like a circular move movement which takes place so this muscle which is in the lower abdomen activates the entire energies in the chakra layer this is very very similar to diaphragmatic breathing in fact agni sara is diaphragmatic breathing only it is now very very intense and here you are actively exhaling <coughs> excuse me you are actively exhaling you are exhaling and pulling in the muscles or contracting the muscles so you actively exhale and passively inhale normally the body your natural breathing is always active inhalation and passive exhalation so in a sense that is reversed that's what happens normally so that is reversed otherwise it is nothing other than diaphragmatic breathing only the posture is different and it helps you to localize the energy in the manipura chakra agni sara is a very very powerful exercise so if you have never done it before you should not do more than 10 a day and then perhaps every week add 10 10 more rounds and then maybe over a period of time you can go up to 100 if you are able to do this this practice is the most famous tantric practice does anybody know the story of the great maharashtra saint sant janeshwar Does anybody know who Sant Janeshwar was from the what was it 17th 18th century Yes Gautam do you know that story where Sant Janeshwar as a child was famous for um something very unique because you know he and his siblings were outcast they were brahmins their father was a brahmin and he was outcast he was thrown out of the brahmin community and so they had no communication with anybody in the village they didn't even get food so the situation for the family was very difficult so sometimes they didn't even have enough you know coal or wood to be able to cook the the the, the rotis the chapatis so he was famous he was known for the fact that you could take a the chapati the bread and put it on his back and it would cook on his back most people think this is only a legend and laugh it off they say oh that's a cute story so do you know that story gautam yeah 
Yes, you've heard of it. Yeah, most people who live in Maharashtra have heard of it. Oh, actually, you should also know it. Good. So this is not just a legend. This, what he was doing was Agnisara. It will produce so much heat in the body if you do it right and over a period of time you have practiced it that your entire body gets hot. Monks in the Himalayas in some Himalayan monasteries earlier they were tested and the test was in the winter to wear a wet shirt and then to do this practice and through the practice generate so much heat that the wet shirt dried in winter in the Himalayas. So this generates that kind of heat in the body. And by doing so it gives you a lot of energy, strength, um, health, removes a lot of blockages and it is not to be confused with Udyan Bandha. So it is, how it is different from diaphragmatic breathing, I've already explained to you. Diaphragmatic breathing is very natural. You are not really trying to do anything. You're merely observing and at the most you're trying to elongate your breath. In diaphragmatic, natural diaphragmatic breathing, your inhalation is uh, normal. You make some effort, but exhalation is always passive. In the Agni Sara, it's not about elongating the breath. You can also elongate the breath. You can do that. So your the Agni Sara, each round takes longer. But the emphasis is on exhaling and contracting the muscle. That's the difference between Agnisara and diaphragmatic breathing. What's the difference between Agnisara and Udyan Bandha? Udyan Bandha is one of the three or four important Bandhas. And basically Udyan Bandha is when you contract your abdominal muscles but you are breathing in and out normally. And why you do that? We will come to in Bandhas. Why do we have bandhas at all? What is the purpose of bandhas? There are basically three main bandhas. Mula bandha, that is the root lock, where you contract the muscles, the anus muscles. The Uriyan bandha is known as also the abdominal lift because you contract the abdominal muscles, you suck them in. Those who are very slim, you know, you may have seen some yogis very slim, Doing the Uriyan Bandha, it seems almost that they have no abdomen. It seems to completely disappear. They suck the abdomen in completely. They have no fat whatsoever on the abdomen. So it looks like their ribs are <clears throat> sticking out. And, the, and then we have Jalandhara uh, Jalan Bandha, which is the neck lock, where <clears throat> the chin is... Uh, placed at the throat. So you bend your head down and you lock your chin into the, the cavity of the throat. Why does one do these bandhas at all? What has the bandhas, what have the bandhas got to do with chakras or with prana? So for that I have a little picture. This is a picture of a boat passing through a canal. The spine or the sushumna, the centralis canalis, is like a stream, like a river, like a stream of energy. And this energy is generally moving downwards. Energy, energy keeps moving downwards, eventually you will die. That's the habit of the body.
what do we want to do? As we start doing pranayam practices, we begin to understand what adi prana means and have mapped out, starting to map out the energies of the body, then we want to reverse this energy. We want to flow upwards to the source. And so, imagine you're on a river in a boat and the boat wants to go upstream. Okay, it's an altitude. You don't see the altitude here so well, but it's an altitude. There's an altitude difference. So it's going up a mountain or up a hill. And you know that's not generally possible for a boat to go uphill. Right? So how would it go uphill? It enters a lock here. That's the lock, canal lock. Water is pumped into this lock. The boat's height increases. This lock is open here. Boat passes out and now it's at a higher level. So here the water is so low and here now the boat has gone up. So this is how a boat goes upwards, up a river, which is in a flowing down the mountain. You know? So it's basically going up the mountain. One of the biggest... Um, lock systems in one of the largest is the Panama Canal. <clears throat> and I think this is a diagram explaining um, the many different lock systems along different rivers along the world, which go through hilly territory, mountainous territory. So if you want to go uphill, that means upstream, you want your energy to flow upwards. With effort, you maybe bring it up to Manipura Chakra. Eventually, you want to be able to take it further up, you know. But the energy tends to always flow downwards. So you need to hold it there. And you hold it by practicing a lock. A bandha. A bandha, you know, in Hindi also means dam. Band means dam. So, that's what it is. It's a dam. Only thing is that you don't practice the bandhas by looking in a book because you won't know when to practice it. If your energy is just flowing, uh, you know, it's just flowing downwards, it, it doesn't matter, right? If, but if it is only starting to flow upwards, only then you uh, want to keep it locked up there, you know, to so take it up. But if it is just flowing down, there is no point in doing mandas. Imagine there would be no difference in altitude and, and the, the river is just flat, just horizontal. And you still keep doing making locks everywhere. What do you achieve out of that? Okay, there's no mountain, there's a river, it's going through the plains, but we put locks along the river. What are you going to achieve out of that? Are you going to achieve anything by doing that? You're just going to waste your time because you don't need any locks. If a boat is flowing along a river, along the plains, you don't need any locks. You need the locks only when the river is in a mountainous area and the boat has to go up. Basically up a mountain. And so if you are doing a practice where you are trying to raise the energy and the energy is starting to move upwards, only when it is starting to move upwards that you need to practice bandhas. If you are not moving, the energy is not moving upwards, you don't need to practice bandhas. When the energy starts moving upwards, the bandhas happen spontaneously and naturally. And the right bandha happens at the right time. So if the energy is located 
uh, around the Manipura chakra, you will suddenly find yourself in the Uriyan Bandha. If the energy is further up, you will suddenly find yourself practicing Jalandhara Bandha. So the Bandhas would then come spontaneously. Okay, was that clear? Any questions on that? So we don't actually practice them, uh, you know, forcefully or as a part of the regular practice? No, no. As I explained, it's a waste of time. It's like a, a river in the plains and you create an elaborate lock system and the boat has to keep going through some locks. It makes no sense, right? It's completely useless. It's a waste of time. So similarly, practicing all these bandhas, it, at the best, it's a waste of time. You know? I don't think there would be any negative uh, effect of that apart from giving a pain in the neck. <laughs> apart from that, I can't imagine that there's going to be any great uh, uh, ill effects out of that. Unless while practicing Uriyan Bandha, you, <clears throat> you again, you know, practicing incorrectly. And that creates some sort of adverse effects. But definitely is going to be of no use to practice it. That's why uh, we don't really teach Bandhas. Well, then that's going to happen. It's going to happen anyway. And this is also one of the reasons why the Bandhas are so mysterious. Most people don't understand this process of the energy flow. You will not find this explained anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so that was the, the bandhas and the mudras. The mudras are again very similar um, to the bandhas, like the bandhas are about energy flow. The mudras are also about energy. They're like energy circuits. I don't know, some of you may be familiar with uh, electricity. In school, you studied electricity. In physics, you may have studied. Um, Closed and closed and open circuits. You know, when the circuit is open, energy does not flow. To make the energy flow, you have to close the circuit, right? So the mudras are like energy circuits. This again comes from a study of also of Ayurveda and I found a diagram which is maybe of some use here and that each of the fingers stands for a certain element so the thumb is Agni fire the index finger is the element of Vayu air the ring finger uh, sorry the middle finger is Akasha or ether the ring finger is Prithvi or Earth, and the little finger is Jala or Vasa, water. Sorry. So these are the five elements that are connected to the fingers. One famous mudra that we use very often is when we put our hands together as a Namaste. It's also known as Anjali mudra, where all the fingers are touching each other. So the thumb touches the thumb. The index finger touches the index finger. The, the middle finger touches the middle finger. The ring finger touches the other ring finger. And the little finger touches the other little finger. So all the hands and fingers are together. So now you have closed the circuit. Imagine that you are like, you know, the circuit here and when the fingers and hands are all together there's a certain flow of energy now that's happening it's a very very subtle energy very fine energy 
And so if you don't have the ability to experience that subtle energy, to you it's just a gesture, right? It's just a mudra, it's just a gesture. It doesn't mean much. One of the reasons why also we say don't waste your time doing all sorts of mudras because it doesn't matter really. There are hundreds of mudras. There are really many, many different kinds of mudras. And nobody needs to learn those complicated things. When the energies start rising along the spine, then you may also spontaneously start doing mudras, certain mudras, whatever mudras. You may not even know what they are called. And you will find yourself doing some mudras. Well-known mudra is jhana mudra that most of us do every day where the thumb and the index finger come together. And so you're connecting this circuit here of air and fire. So these are small little circuits that are being created. And energy flows, very subtle energy flows that way. The other well-known mudra is Vishnu Mudra, which we do, uh, we have done that before, we have gone through it when we practice Nadi Shodhanam, also known as Anulom Vilom, and um, that is a mudra that we, we do use, but not recommended to use uh, over a period of time. Or Dhyana Mudra, Dhyana Mudra is when you Put your palm facing upwards in your lap during meditation and put the other palm over it, also facing upwards. It's also a position for sitting in meditation, just like you can sit in using Jhana Mudra, you can also sit in Dhyana Mudra. So that's what the mudras are about. Any questions regarding mudras? Okay, so mudras is uh, also a very uh, esoteric topic and as I said, these also, um, e these are far more subtler even than the bandhas. And so, it's not something we know, need to go into very deep. So having gone through this, you know, um, the energy flow, the pranic flow throughout the body, mapping the body, we should understand the difference between breath, prana, kundalini, and shakti. Breath, very often is also known as just, people say, oh, that's prana. Everything is prana. But there's a specific term that we use for breath, and that is known as vayu. Actually, inhalation and exhalation is vayu. Prana is life itself, energy itself. It's much deeper. So in the breathless state, a yogi who is in samadhi, he does not breathe, but he's not dead. He's still got life in him. So, therefore, that's the deeper level of prana. Kundalini is when that prana or energy is concentrated. very focused and concentrated. Let me see if I can just find that diagram again. Hmm. Okay, I can't find it, but everybody knows the diagram. I'm referring to the diagram of the, the body, the inhalation, exhalation, the Conscious mind, the unconscious mind, are the prana and the center of consciousness. So the breath is the most external. Kundalini 
is just another word for Adi Prana. It's the more focused energy. It's not spread out, dissipated, but it's very, very focused. And Shakti is universal consciousness. Everything is finally Prana. Everything is finally Shakti. So when the energy is scattered, it's also called prana, and when it's focused, con condensed focus, it's called kundalini, and it is generally focused along the centralis canalis or the sushum nanadi. A modern word for kundalini is also unconscious mind. That's another way of saying the energy that is stored in the unconscious mind. When that starts coming forward, that is basically nothing other than kundalini. Any questions about that? About these four different aspects? Distinction between breath, prana, kundalini and shakti? I have something not directly related but something that was in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is related to the five koshas. Yes. And in the koshas, the pranamaya kosh comes before the layer of the mind, one of my kosh. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, yes. But in the diagram, it, the prana place is after mind is passed. Yeah, yeah. Because um, there are two levels of that. Yeah, okay, I got it now. Just a minute, I'll just put that up. Yeah, okay. So you have the Anamaya Kosha, which is the most gross form of energy. Yeah. Then the Pranamaya Kosha, which is the second form of energy. And that is the Pranic energy or the vehicles or the Nadis. But subtler than the Nadis are, is the mind. Yes, it's also more diffuse, but it's located more around the brain. So it is more focused, it's more dense. Okay. Beyond that is intuition or what is called Vijayanamaya Kosha, which is none other than Buddhi. So that's even more dense, more focused form of energy. Now you come to Anandamaya Kosha. I have called it deep sleep here. The only difference is that if you and I are talking about it, you know, if there's somebody who is, the difference would be is the person who is going to sleep at night, goes to deep sleep, is in a state of tamas. But if you have someone who goes into yoga nidra, consciously experience it, he experiences a sattva. And that itself is also pure energy. It's pure sattva. It's energy. And then comes pure consciousness, which is nature is life pure energy or pure life. So, your question was that how is this prana coming here? It should be deeper, right? But this yes. se second one is referring merely to the map, you know, the, the, the nadis. But the mind is subtler than that. And intuition is subtler than that. And Pure sattva is still sattva. Okay. So the level of Adi Prana would be actually number five then? Yes, so it's, it's right here. It's probably between. It comes out of here into this. Okay. And then it continues. This arrow, for example, you can say then becomes the spine. The sushumna. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So and this would then bring us actually very appropriately to Laya. The universe itself is an expansion. So imagine that there's just a dot. Comes a ring, the second ring, the third ring, the fourth ring, the fifth ring. Like ripples, you know, in the water if you throw a stone in a pond, the ripples keep expanding. And that expansion is the universe. That's how you expand, you manifest outwards. From pure consciousness you come outwards until you get a body and then you contract again and go back here to this point eventually and that is the cosmic breath Laya Yoga Laya so when it inhales the world disappears goes back and it exhales you are born, the world is, is created. Then there is pralai, all these things, macrocosm, micro, macrocosm, microcosm. So it goes into that direction. I don't think we need to cover that here unless people are interested. But this is the cosmic breath. This is known as laya. And for those of you who aspire to attain pure consciousness, the journey is going inwards. Mastery comes when you can do both. You can go inwards and then outwards. And you remember that you're here, out in the external world, and yet you remember your core is pure consciousness. That is Purna Mark. So, any questions so far? Or any comments? Anything to share? It doesn't have to be only about this session, it could be anything general about Pranayam. I have a small question about the locks. The what? The locks, yeah. The lock. So, it's, uh, I understand it's something like uh, the, the, uh, the posture in which you sit and you don't have to do anything. The student has, doesn't have to prepare for it or like plan around it. It will just happen naturally. Like the what do you sit in? Poster? Well, I didn't get no, that. Uh, the, the, uh, you always mentioned that... Uh, that you sit in the pose that is comfortable for you and sit there, something ah, happens, you don't mm, have to start right, preparing for it. Right, right, mm. Something like that, the locks, I understand, are something like that. There is no planning around it. It, it will happen naturally. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello? Yeah. So, so in the in, in the last uh, in the last meeting, I had a question about the picture, about the particular color of process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ask it now. Yes, of course, yeah, of course. So my question was, so my question was, could I could we use any kind of mantra while this, you know, doing this particular color? No? It's not necessary. It's not required. It's not required. Shikalikarna, the focus is more on the breath in Shikalikarna. You see, there are many different versions of these practices. In this tradition, we always try to make the practices very simple. And while they're simple, they're not simplistic. You know, the simpler practices go deeper. And the complicated practices keep you distracted. When you have two or three different things, the mind is not focused. So in this practice of Shiddali Karna, there is no need for any mantra. And uh, one does it. The focus of Shiddali Karna, as I said, is to first uh, to shorten the breath towards Kumbhak and then come out again. So that actually is a process of like going inwards and coming out. It is actually... Uh, Kind of a practice of Shri Vidya. 
Okay, and another thing is that I found out that if I can, if I try to visualize breath in the opposite way, that is during Chitili Karana, in the um, uh, source of the, that is you are inhaling or ex from some, some place of the body and then coming to the crown of the head. Yes. Suppose you are uh, inhaling or exhaling from the toes and then coming to the crown of the head. Yes. So I saw that if I do it in the opposite direction, that is uh, start either inhale or exhale from the crown of the head and then go to another part of the body, uh, that becomes easier for me to uh, do. So is it the right way to do or the, uh, the way that you said is the only, only way? Well, the way I said was you you uh, exhale from the crown of the head to the toes, for example, and then from the toes you inhale and go back, right? And you're saying you want to do the yeah. reverse. You you want to do the opposite, is it? Yeah, I mean, I found that uh, I found that I mean, if my I mean, if I can inhale from the crown and go to the toes, yes, and then again can come from the toes and exhale from the crown. That becomes, I mean, uh, like uh, I can, I mean, I can imagine inhaling. When I inhale, I usually go downwards, and when I exhale, I usually come upwards. That's why it is uh, becoming easier for me. But that's exactly what I said. I said exhale and go down to the toes, and inhale and come up from the toes to the crown of the head. Is that what you're doing? In the opposite, opposite. You're doing the opposite. So it's it's uh, it's which we confusing. So it's yeah. like uh, uh, like the source, like the like in your case, the source is uh, some place in the body, and uh, a find and find a ground of the head. It is uh, okay. Let Let's just do it from the beginning, just to clarify this. Uh, you you start the first very step would be just plain diaphragmatic breathing, and then you start by breathing from the crown of the head to the toes, breathing out, exhaling. And then you inhale from the toes to the crown of the head. Is that what you're doing or you're doing the opposite? Yeah, the opposite. You're doing the opposite. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Um, if, if your normal energy, I just explained this when we were talking about the bandhas, that normally the energy, like it, like the river flows down the mountain, no? from, from the summit, from, if there's imagine a river, the source is up right at the top of the mountain, and then it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, right? It's, it's coming down the mountain, right? So now the boat wants to go up, right? You want to go to the source, right? In spirituality, we always say you want to go to the source. The source is on top of the mountain. So now, how will you go to the top of the mountain? Right? Naturally, the river always flows downwards, right? Gravity. So river always flows downwards. It doesn't flow upwards. Yeah. Yes. So what you are trying to do is we have to reverse the flow. So that's why you breathe down by exhaling and breathe up and inhale. So you're trying to reverse the flow. Normal, that's exactly why you are more comfortable doing the opposite. Because doing the opposite is what everybody is doing. That's that's the natural way. But we want to reverse it. Alright? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yes. I understand it now. Yes. It's with all the practices, whether you do sushumna, uh, you know, kriya, where you go up and down the spine, it's always you exhale and go down, inhale and go up. It's always like that because you're reversing the flow of the energies. That's why you have a band, you want to go upwards, you know, the band is following the system of locks along the channel, the water canal, you, the boat is going upwards. So always we are trying to go upwards. Okay. Good. Any more questions regarding any aspect of pranayam? Because now we are finished with mastering pranayam. So this was our last session today. 
about the master and pranayam. We won't have a session next time. So if there are any questions, now is the time to ask them. Okay, then everybody seems to be fine. So we can end the session, yeah? Thank you, everybody. See you on Friday.